Okay, so I remembered to record. So let me let me say that again. At the end of the last class, which Mia and Alex are required to look at the video, it says in the next class, I will start out asking you which path of life are you on? Pleasure. Uh, oh my gosh. Anyway, uh, renunciate, wait. Pleasure, success. Pleasure, success, duty, or God. And then which path to God would make the most sense to you? All right, that was the beginning question. All right, so I think last time I started with Jack. So I'll start with Melanie first. Um, so I think I'm on, I don't really know. If I'm going to be honest, I don't really know yet what path I'm at. I don't think I'm at God or duty right now. I think I would be more on the line of success just because I'm still kind of feeling out everything and figuring out what exactly I want to follow. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the second question? If insofar as you're seeking out a path not not necessarily to god to the good right that's what you're seeking yes right so do you think of it this this would be the way to ask the broader question as a humanist do you approach it in terms of the definitions and reflecting on like the definitions or knowledge of the tradition you know, the excerpt we read about the history of humanism, is that sort of what gets you connected? Or is it some people that you know that are authentic humanists and you, you know, like they're your role models? That would be the path of the heart, is the path through relationships? Or is it through action, like you watched people demonstrating in Black Lives Matter, and you thought, like, I want to be engaged like that. I want action to support. That's what humanism is to me, are those people that demonstrate and get out in the street or become lawyers, human rights lawyers or something. Or <laughs> meditation. That's an out. You've already thrown that one out last week, last time, Melanie, right? It's religion. That's the part you don't like, correct? Right, yes. <laughs> okay, so which of those three do you think resonate the most with you? Um, probably, well, definitely when like I'm reading different things about humanism and all of that. Um, I feel like I connect most when I'm reading things and gaining knowledge about it. But also that could be because I'm just now figuring out that I'm a humanist and I haven't, you know, evolved yet. Yeah, so you should pro probably buy that book because it's kind of a classic in humanist studies. Does that make sense, Melanie, if you, if you want to read more? Yeah, that makes sense. I actually was interested after last class, I was going to look into it. Okay, and then you're, I mean, no, with the way with the web, you'll just get inundated if you punch humanist, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, there's journals and, oh, geez. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if I were you, I'd start with Corliss Lamont because he's kind of the Bible of modern humanism. And then, and he, you know, tells the history that goes back to the Renaissance and you know the history before the Renaissance, right? You've studied yeah. that. And you're not going to find that under humanism. No. Dr. Beck is weird. So, um, yeah. And then you can go from there. Like, if you want to read more about the founding fathers as humanists, right? But, I mean, you just pick your picket. Um, I, my in-laws were Quakers. Those are sort of major humanists. And then the Unitarians. And I live like five blocks from a Quaker meeting. And I live three miles from a Unitarian church. And my best friend from high school goes to that church. And my ex-in-laws went to the other one. So I, 
needless to say, living in Batesville was difficult. Shall we say that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Jack, what do you think? Which path in life are you on? Um, I would say I'm on the path of duty, I think. Okay. Like living for the sake of something greater than yourself. Okay. And so that's why you don't know what you're going to major in yet. And you're not obsessing about that, right? It's not worrying you. Yeah. If, if it was success, you would think, oh, geez, I got to start studying for something that can get me a job. And yeah, okay, that makes, that makes sense to me. Um, Melanie, what is your major? Um, business and economics. Oh yeah, okay. All right, well, actually you can look up a uh, humanistic business, human, you know, humanism and business because I taught business ethics and I don't know if I said this before, but I've had nothing to do with business. I mean, when I told my sister and brother-in-law, I, I was teaching business ethics, it's like, she's the last person in the world. Like she doesn't have anything to do with the business world. She doesn't even buy stuff. She goes to goodwill. I mean, she, like nobody is as disconnected from the free market profit market thing than, than you. But what I learned was, if you really want to be a missionary, you run a business because the people working for you are vulnerable. They depend on you to survive. And so you have a lot of power over them. And if you, you can really treat them like crap and they'll still have the job. But if you treat them, you can also treat them with dignity and you can give them a sense of respect and you can organize a business so that they are cultivating their capabilities. And if you're really a good business owner, a lot of your people leave and start their own businesses because you, you promoted them and encouraged them to become self-sufficient, but you should be happy about that. Anyway, I learned a lot and I do think our country is profoundly affected by whether the people in business are greedy or humanistic. Does that make sense, Melanie? Yes, that makes sense. Did you know um, Claire Shirley? Uh, no, I did not. Oh, I don't know. You might want to connect with her. I could connect you with her. She just graduated and she was an RPH minor major. She's a lot like you and she was a business person and she got a job, I think in Springfield at a bank. Um, so I, I really think you'd like her, but I'm not going to force this. It's just <laughs> that if you ever think, well, sure, just for Dr. Beck's sake, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter, you know, but you do remind me of her. And the nice thing about the way I structure my classes is I kind of get to know the students in this kind of resonate way, right? Yeah. And um, so I can kind of spot who would resonate, but I'm never a matchmaker, guys, ever, ever. I wouldn't touch that one. Um, then you get blamed, you know. Um, okay, Jack, you're on the path of success. And then which path works when you're trying to figure out your idea of the good, right? Connect with the universe or God or what you think is good, right? A good life. I would say the path of knowledge. I okay. Think one of them. Yeah. So are there books? Do you think you've read some books that have just sort of made you aware of a certain layer of culture that that you really connect with what do you mean well like melanie had the the humanism and i suggested you buy that whole book and find out about the tradition is did you have any book where you read about a, a tradition 
or a doctrine or something and it, it just sort of like yeah that fits with the way I think about how to live the best life the best way to connect with the universe and myself I don't know if there's a specific book for me can you think of just books that just sort of struck you yeah um I've read some um, uh, Dostoevsky, I think. He's pretty good. I, I took a whole semester on him. Yeah. Uh, 200 pages a week. So which book was it? Did you read Letters from an Underground? Uh, yeah, Notes from Underground is one of my favorites. OK, that's good. Um, the Death of Ivan Illich is another just a short story that I just sort of, I think it's kind of on that plane. Um, did you read Crime and Punishment? I have not. Oh my God. Yeah, it's a classic. Well, it's about utilitarianism. You know the plot? Mm -mm. This intellectual guy, he knows that this old lady has all this money and she just sits on it and she's just greedy. And he wants to take that money and distribute it to people, right? He's, utilit he's utilitarian, right? He wants to be progressive. Uh, Russia's always had a terrible problem with no middle class. And so he's trying to be a reformer. And I think he botches the thing and ends up killing the lady. I don't think he planned that. And so the whole book is about this police officer sort of figuring it out and trying to figure out how to psych this guy. I mean, it's very psychological. <laughs> and it's, but it's, you know, Dostoevsky really wrestled with those problems of modernity in, in Russia. Um, the Brothers Karamazov is, a right, is about that. And I remember reading these books. It's just like, oh, I'd spend all afternoon in Dostoevsky's world um, but I remember in high school, I was reading that one and we had like two feet of snow and I had to go out and shovel and it was like cutting a piece of cake. It was really, and I was so depressed. <laughs> I was so depressed, but, um, so that Dostoevsky's good. He wrestles with these questions. I just wish there were more novelists that are philosophical like that. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Um, Tolstoy, uh, War and Peace is very philosophical, but um, I'm also thinking of, you know, letters from an underground are just kind of a different genre. And I did like that genre. I just can't think off the top of my mind. Um, did either of you ever read 1984? No. Okay, that's a classic ninth grade awakening story. <laughs> and I had that exact experience. But anyway, um, actually, that's a good segue into one of the main themes today was the Bhagavad Gita. And Gandhi read the Bhagavad Gita and it changed his life. Um, so that's important. In, and um, his secretary said that he always had that with him. He quoted it all the time. So I, I will explain that. Um, so I've already talked too much. Um, so so we covered that my thing about Hinduism, it's a very old religion. So it really accounts for a lot. There's the Catholic Benedictine tradition. Um, and, and there's just a lot of evidence that people are healthier. Those nuns, they live forever. <laughs> because they don't have stress because they have this friendship bond, right? They have all these friends they can rely on. And each, they work together, they're assigned. So the head of it, the abbess, 
uh, meets with each nun and um, they decide together what position she should have based on her talents and what's needed. And they aren't always perfect matches, but the nuns just accept that they've entered the community. And it really is good for your health. <laughs> they live to be in their 90s, over 100. Um, so whereas our society just, it socially constructs stress, and then it gives you all these wonderful drugs. <laughs> to ease your stress. Okay, so the question, what do you really want? And then each of you, if you, you're probably still asking and you should continue to ask. Um, Melanie might try business and decide it's not what she really wants. There's lots of other stuff. Um, if Jack is on the path of duty rather than success, that's, that's the question. Another option, I just want to throw this in because I never did before, but the Clinton School for Public Service is an excellent education. And it's for people who want to work in public policy, who want to work in this country or abroad, um, helping lift up poor people in some way, like you get educated. So it might be running a nonprofit, it might be just education, it might be working in public policy for a government or something. But um, if you, you know, that's something that satisfies a sense of duty, um, as well as being a perfectly legitimate middle class life. So you could check that out if you want to. Um, so the spiritual seeker, and this is this is what Mueller calls the best um, counterpart to the West for obvious reasons, right? If you decide your goal is to just get in touch with the Atman, you just completely turn inward. And all these exercises are, again, well documented. Are we, with all of our uh, electrodes on the head, head machines say, gee, these meditation exercises, they really work. It's like, yeah, they've been tested for a long time. Um, so the path of knowledge. Um, and do you remember on Confucius, I had that article on emotional um, EQ, emotional maturity. And again, um, this Hinduism, the qualities of character that it promotes are the same qualities that Trevor, Mr. Travis makes millions of bucks selling in his books. <laughs> um, and I don't make nothing. I just say, you know, somebody thought about that a long time ago. All right, and the path of God. And this one is, they, they have to apologize. So this is the opposite of most Christians. If you don't believe in God, if you don't believe God didn't create Adam and Eve and God has a special relation to Israel and God got the Hebrews out of Egypt and brought them to the promised land and you have to believe this whole historical narrative. If you don't believe that, you know, you're going to hell. Whereas in Hinduism, you know, it's not an absolute. It's just one way to envision. If you think there's only one way, then you're not in touch with the Brahman, right? The Brahman is the universe. There isn't one way. If you want to personify it that way, because that's what you heard when you were a little kid, fine. But don't fall in love with the doctrines or that one image of Jesus or whatever. It's, it's energy. It's way beyond any kind of visual, sensual image. And it's way beyond any one historical narrative. Um, so there is a fundamental difference there. 
Um, and that might again be why Melanie says it's too religious for me. <laughs> Does that make sense, Melanie? Yes, definitely. <laughs> these are these are quarrels between religions, and humanism does tend to reject rituals, symbols, you know, that sort of stuff. But usually humanists have their people they admire, right? Um, Oh, let me think. Uh, the Quakers have, uh, anyway, who founded the Quaker? Oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, that Fox, I think, he founded Quakerism. And um, the Unitarians, Thomas Jefferson is one of their main guys. Um, but anyway, oftentimes they'll have role models or icons, but they really, they tend to go from the image to an argument. So a, a joke about Unitarians is that they have, you know, what is God? And they'll have the Hindu answer, the Buddhist answer, and then the Unitarian debate at 10 o'clock Sunday morning. <laughs> so they'll debate about it, right? They don't have any sort of weird object that they focus on. Um, all right. Four stages of life. Hinduism is an old religion, so it accounts for changes in life. Whereas the Western human, you know, the Western rights, like the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, or our Declaration of Independence, the right to life, liberty, pursuit, it doesn't distinguish between children's rights and old people's rights and all this stuff. It doesn't flow with the organic part of human life, whereas Hinduism definitely is in the flow. Um, this one is just dealing with the fact that people are different. They're different in their abilities. They're different in how much responsibility they want to take. So it's, you know, the goal is to place people in positions where they feel satisfied and they can live the life that makes sense to them. That's also spiritual. That's the trouble. It has to be spiritual and then um, contributing to the whole. So when you make everything competitive, all that matters is how much money you make. You're going to get all sorts of managers and bosses that are not very good bosses. <laughs> They're just good at kissing up to the one who hired them. So this, you know, this makes sense. There's a reason for having things like that. The soul's coming of age in the universe is it, it really, this is where Gandhi combined social reform with Hinduism, right? Because Hinduism without Gandhi and that kind of social activism can get pretty passive, uh, at least from a Westerner's point of view, right? There's no social progress. It, and then their notion of uh, time, right? But the nice thing here, I like this last quote, that you climb life's mountain from any side. When you reach the top, the trails converge and you can see, right? You can see the, the human condition, human nature. So you could see humanism as one other path to an eye of the soul that sees what humanity is about. So if you're a secular humanist, you could say the history of humankind is just people trying to become fully human and getting frustrated. And religions sometimes encourage that and sometimes discourage it, which is why you wouldn't want to associate with the other paths. Um, but once you get to the top, then you would say, you see, it's all about humanity. It's not about the doctrines or the rituals. And then you look down and you see people coming up the mountain. And the reason they have a doctor is they started over there on that side of the mountain. And that was the only option over there. 
but gradually you come up and you get to the top. So Hinduism is very tolerant, obviously, of lots of worldviews. Okay, ah, and this one, and I'll talk and then I'll ask you what you think. This one is about that we tend in the West, we have this different personality types. We have, you know, their people are different, but everybody's got to go to whatever class, you know, what floats your boat? Are you going to take your kid to karate or soccer? What sport are they in? What instrument do they play? What, you know, you drive them around. I was in the car 25 hours a week for a while, <laughs> driving to work and back, driving my kids to ballet and soccer and confirmation and all this stuff. I was in the car all the time. And that's the West. That's that's what we do. Um, okay, so do you all know about the Myers Briggs? Did you I did you read this? Did you know about it beforehand? Um, what about you, Melanie? Uh, yeah, I had learned about it beforehand. Uh, and I also like in a few of my business classes, we, I guess, had to take a test to determine what we were. That's what I said, right? That's how they originally in, in the West, they were run by corporations so the corporations could place you better and make more money, right? Whereas in Hinduism, it's the spiritual thing, you know, it's not a financial thing. Do you remember what you tested as? I'm trying to remember. I think I was either INFJ or INFP. Yeah, okay. I would definitely say IN. Yeah, it was definitely um, IN. I just can't remember the last two. Right. Okay. I My guess would be you're at least kind of borderline between F and T um, thinking, because if you were just feeling, you wouldn't be moved by humanism, right? That's a, that's a thing in your head, right? Do you see what I mean? I mean, yeah, you, you attach it to your, I mean, you're attaching your way of life and your emotions, but it's an idea that got you going. So that's got to be some tea there. Right. Do you understand how some people never seem to be motivated by an idea? Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, <coughs> or it's just an afterthought and pretty poorly thought out. And then I don't know about J and P. If you, if you like to go with the flow and say, okay, we'll decide this later. If it's like, no, we got it. We got to make this decision. We got to make that decision. Yeah, I'm more um, of a, we need to make this decision now. <laughs> okay, well, that, that makes sense since you tend to get your assignments in, you mm -hmm. know, and the students who want to think about it more, right, <laughs> or they're, that, at least that's what they say. Right. Um, <laughs> but a, a, a J will get it in. You know, I haven't thought it all through, but I'm going to get it done. I'm going to move on. Uh, what about you, Jack? Have you ever taken this test? Yeah, I got an INTJ. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. I'm that's I'm over here too, and um, the trouble with me is when I have taken it when I had three little kids, I just was talking to the test what do you mean when I'm being a mom or when I'm being myself like what the heck you know I changed when I was a mom I did all sorts of stuff I never would have chosen to do and also I had a kid when I was 21 so I never really had a chance to figure out what I would do on my own um but yeah I I tend I think I'm INTJ too um, does that make sense to the to both of you that you're both kind of I N T or F and J? Does that make sense to you just from what you say? Yes. Okay. So I remember finding out I think one and a half percent of the population 
is what I am, or maybe three, but it really helped. That was the one thing that helped me because I don't know about you, but I really thought I was a Martian from another planet a lot of times because I, people didn't talk about the stuff that was in my head and what was in my head, you know, I couldn't talk about. And I felt like, what is wrong with me? I'm not the way I take in life, the way I filter it. And I talked to my brother and sister about my parents. It was like, they're totally different people. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if that's true of you. Jack, do you sometimes think like, where did I come from? Yeah, my, definitely different from my parents and how I process things. So when you found this out, was that something of a relief? I guess so, yeah. What about you, Melanie? Yeah, actually over um, the summer, I was thinking the same thing, just kind of like, I don't feel like I'm from here. Like, I don't feel like I should be here, <laughs> but yeah, it, it makes sense now. Okay. Well, that is what college is for, especially small liberal arts, where you have to take these classes that appeal the different parts of your brain, your teachers are motivated to teach this stuff. So that, that was the idea that you would, everyone would get placed in something where they would be motivated to contribute. But these questions, I, I, some of the questions I felt like this is a blunt instrument, you know, cause it's none of the above <laughs> or every once in a while, all of the above. But I suppose if they ask enough of them, it sort of comes out, right? Um, anyway, so that's that. And then I wanted to point out that the Bible also, people recognize these different, um, different gifts, same spirit, but it was always spirit connected to spirituality. It wasn't connected to getting placed better in a company. Um, all right. So then the next one is um, the Gita. And we don't have time, I knew this, to read from it. But if you bought one of those little Gita books, um, here's the basic story. Arjuna's cousins committed a terrible crime. I can't remember, it doesn't even matter what it was, but they engaged in a massacre. And so now it's his spiritual duty, his family, in order to bring back positive karma. So they, his cousins created all this negative karma. Somebody has to um, recalibrate, you know, has to stop the negative karma and bring the universe back into balance. And so his, his family has to do this. And at the beginning, He's heading for the, the campaign. He sees his cousins and he says, I can't do this. I can't kill my cousins. I know them, you know? So he falters. So that's when Vishnu comes in the form of Krishna and comes to him. Now you could, this is your alter ego, I think, right? I think all this stuff is symbolic and all of us, I think, have voices in our heads, <laughs> at least. And Socrates did. And uh, so that's why if you say you have voices in your head, you get thrown in a mental institution or you become a Plato scholar. So, okay. Or a Hindu scholar because they have voices in their head. Um, so, and Krishna is sort of his alter ego talking to him. And Krishna says, no, you have to do this. And the main issue there is you have to do it for the right reason in the right way, okay? Which is you have to stay detached. You can't be bloodthirsty, right? Don't take any pleasure out of this, but you have to do it, even if it's, you know, do it, 
while maintaining your distance, okay? So Krishna tells him you have to have a right thinking mind. And this is important because when wars, wars brutalize people, right? War puts people in situations where you're killing your own kind. And this is not, you know, animals do not tend to do that. Um, I'm not sure if, I suppose there are examples of some animals that kill their own kind, but uh, human beings, you know, they create these systems and all these ideas and they decide that somebody's unjust. And in the name of justice or injustice or karma, whatever, they literally purposefully kill members of their species. And this is not natural. So you have to have some kind of a way to think about it, to avoid people from being absolutely brutalized and dehumanized from it. Now we talk about PTSD. Um, they used to call it shell shock, but it has a profound psychological impact. So this, the Gita is designed to try and enable justice to prevail without brutalizing people, but the number one meaning of this text is about the war inside of you. It's all symbolic for the kind of battles you go, you take on inside of you. Um, all right. So Krishna does talk about the four paths and um, he links it to the other philosophies and religions, right? There are other incarnations, um, Jesus, Buddha, um, Socrates and Confucius and then moderation can you believe it he also talks about that so we have Aristotle and we have Confucius and we have Krishna they're all talking about moderation the relation between nature and culture is really important right the natural world is energy formed in complex ways Remember the creation story? And human beings are just the emergence of a form of energy that actually has consciousness and is aware of the universe as all this energy. So staying in touch with that energy, the Atman is uh, number one. So you're supposed to kill your cousins and still maintain your relationship to the Atman. Then, at a certain point, uh, Arjuna has this revelation of the Brahman energy everywhere. And it's it's like 10 pages, <laughs> Every, all, you know, blah, blah, and all blah, blah. Um, so if, again, if you have time to read it, just imagine being, being a Hindu reading this. And it's supposed to sort of implant itself in your psyche. Like Gandhi said, it became part of him. He always referred to it in his activity. Then the character traits, and this always has to do with translations. It's just that it follows so closely with Aristotle's virtues that, you know, you start, you think this is the human condition. It's not true because Aristotle said it or true because the Gita said it or true because Jesus said it. It's just, what people figure out is the, the way that we need to live in order to live together and in order to develop our humanity. So you're humble. Remember that rational honor means that you live honorably, but you don't expect to be honored. Yeah, but you make sure to honor other people. So you tend to underestimate your value just to keep everybody from being jealous and competing for honor, truthfulness, self-knowledge, um, harmlessness, don't take revenge, being patient is even tempered, remember that? Honor, reverence for the wise, that's Confucian, but Aristotle also said that. 
uh, we should respect our elders because they have experience. Um, purity, constancy, control of self, that would be temperance. Uh, contempt of sense, delight is temperance. Self-sacrifice, okay. This might also be why Melanie doesn't like religions because they tend to, to think of self-sacrifice when really that's a stupid idea of yourself. If you're a humanist, you say, no, it's all about self-affirmation, but the true self, right? Your humanity, which is your capacity for uh, justice and virtue. Um, so there's no need to sacrifice if you have the right idea of yourself. Um, okay, so the actually the, being accepting that there are um, problems, right? There's negative karma, there's birth, death, aging, disease, that's just part of life. And so to have courage in the face of those things, that's Aristotle. Um, detachment. So this is this is di a difference. Um, so with Aristotle, you wanted to be as attached, you want to have as many relationships and friendships as possible, because that's being fully human. And in Confucianism, of course, your humanity is sort of realized through your relationships. That's number one. But in Hinduism, you're detached right? You maintain detachment from home, children, wife. It's not that you don't care about them, but you would never let them bother you, right? You don't let them get a rise out of you. So it's not like the Greeks would say getting angry for the right reason in the right way at the right time. It's more like stepping back and just walking away from it or just talking out of it, but no, no anger. An ever tranquil heart, um, a will set forth to worship me, me only. And me means the Brahman, loving solitude. Um, okay, character traits. Again, there's two different sections that have a whole list of character traits. Uh, truthfulness, slowness to wrath, even temperedness. Um, okay, so that's that was my main point there with the Gita. Um, Gandhi outlines. So I think I have time to do this. I want to read from this book about Gandhi's life. And um, I think I'll just undo the screen share because uh, this is so important. Um, all right. Let's see. Gandhi's activism. He, let's see, I got to Where's number one? Okay. So we start out with his, um, Okay, his activism. And if you want to watch the movie, Gandhi, it's really good. But he wanted to get the British out of India. I guess, okay, I'll, I'll start with that outline. And all right, he was shy, he's introverted. And that was interesting. How can an introvert lead such a huge movement? And that was a big deal. He got married at age 13. Uh, he lived in this family. He and his wife never really did get along very well. <laughs> um, he went to London to school because that was what, if you were parents who were ambitious for your children, the point is to make them into Westerners. The people were completely convinced that Western culture is superior and their cultures are inferior. And if they want their children to be civilized, as well as successful, then they have to be wannabe Westerners. And Gandhi completely bought into it. He, um, he had the clothes, he had the food, you know, everything. He wanted to reject his own culture. He read the, the Old and New Testament, especially the Sermon on the Mount. 
And he said, it went straight to his heart. And one of the things he said was, gee, Westerners have a really great religion. They ought to try it. <laughs> they don't practice it, right? It really is pretty good. You'd never guess. And I think that's true, right? We went over the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think if somebody reads about Americans and then they read the Sermon on the Mount, it's like, wait a sec, there's a huge disconnect here. Um, but when he read the Gita, it had this great impact. When he's when he has doubts uh, about the movement, which it it had, you know, years of stay, stagnation, uh, he would, you can imagine, he would step back, maintain his composure. You know, he's on this project to take out the bad karma in in around him, which is the British occupation. And so he wants to remove that bad karma and he's going to do it without becoming brutal. He's going to do it just by focusing on staying in touch with the Atman. So he wanted to stay in touch with the Atman while he's getting rid of the British, which makes perfect sense to me that that's, he reads the Gita a lot or he refers to it. Um, the Orthodox interpretation um, is that it had to do with caste obligation and that that because you're a certain member of the, your caste and somebody from another caste violated someone in your caste, you go and, you know, kill them. And that was awful, right? That's repugnant. But Gandhi saw it as an allegory for what goes on inside of you and also getting rid of the British. All right, so hold alike pleasure and pain. That's a quote from the um, Gita. Gandhi was a yogi. He was on the path of action. He tried to detach himself from desires. This is not indifference, obviously. He's very engaged, uh, but he renounces desires. Okay, acting while renouncing the fruit of actions. He doesn't always worry about consequences. He just keeps going with what's the right thing to do. Um, now, he went back to India and he was, so here he was a uh, just a, not a very good lawyer, right? He failed at a bunch of odd jobs. He was a real disappointment for a while. Um, then his brother required legal assistance. If you watch this movie, it's very moving. He goes to this, he, look, he's already been to London. He's completely sold out. He, he wears the suits, you know, he rejects his culture. Other people from India, when they look at him, they go, oh, that's one of them. That's one of those wannabe Westerners. He's too good for us, you know, or he's a member of the Brahmin class or the it's actually administrative class, right? People who are ambitious for high positions, like he went to law school. Anyway, he went to the law office and they treated him like dirt, right? They, they just completely racist treatment. And that really shocked him because, you know, he'd been told this was a superior culture. <laughs> And they were so cruel to him. Then he went to South Africa and he got kicked out of the first class car, even though he paid his money. And those two episodes completely changed his life because he realized he shouldn't have sold out to the West, right? This is not what they told me it was. So I'm going to go back to my people, right? And my religion. And I'm going to affirm something other than the West. So he delivered a speech on white discrimination. And this is really important. You can ask if, if you know people at Lyon or if you've known anybody, how can people feel honored by humiliating other people? I don't know if that happens, but I know it, I don't know if you've run into that but it really is an awful thing. 
And I, I think it's, if you don't grow out of it by eighth grade or ninth grade, it's terribly spiritually um, corrupt. I understand seventh and eighth grade girls, right? <laughs> like me, um, but maybe boys too. I mean, but it's very juvenile and it's spiritually really ugly. Then they had a war, the British versus the Dutch and Gandhi, he helped the British. They didn't want his help again because of the racism. They don't want to believe they depend on him, but then they did depend on him. He got involved in raising his children. He has now become counterculture. He's going to question everything. So he's questioning gender roles. He questioned um, the underclass, the untouchables. He made his wife wash the chamber pots. And that was, she did not like that. <laughs> but can you understand psychologically? Like he questioned, he's starting to question everything. And he's focused, focusing on staying in touch with his Atman. And then he's saying, you know, the caste system is not staying in touch with the Atman. It's an orthodoxy but it's, it's not succeeding, it's corrupt. So he became much more serious about his religion and that was related to his politics, right? He felt like he's got to get rid of this karma in the world. So Satangriya was truth force, soul force. And that was this maintaining your composure while you engage in this nonviolent resistance. Um, so he started out with 12 followers and two years later, it takes time. And then in India, he advocated simple living. He went back to India. He was a reformer of Hinduism, like Buddha, and we'll get to Buddha later, but he's a reformer of Hinduism. He looked beyond national freedom to social freedom. So he didn't want... He wanted to get rid of the British, but he wanted the people in India not to think of his movement as just political. He wanted them to think of it as spiritual. Um, okay. Uh, Gandhi's uh, thing was village uplift. So 80% of the people lived in villages. And so again, he was raised to become part of the elite. And he rejected that. And he went back to the villages and tried to help them help themselves. Um, okay. During World War I, okay, um, they suffered more oppression. And then they thought it would get better, but it got worse. So, so now they're getting exploited even more because the British need need even more because they're going to war and um they start resisting with economic they refuse to shop in the british shops right and um so here's the story of the massacre um gandhi was into village uplift and the way he did that was the british would the they in India, they would grow cotton just like in the US, and then they would ship it over to Britain and Britain would make it into cloth in their, in their factories. And then they would sell it back at 800 times the price. And so in uh, Gandhi got everyone made this little loom uh, that they could, they could run with their feet and then they would weave cloth. And so you had in the movie, you have this people all in row after row, just a huge number of people all working on these looms and weaving this cloth. So they're becoming self-reliant. And then another thing was salt. They had to buy salt from the British. Like they don't have money. And so he wanted to go to the ocean and, um, they collected ocean water on these very flat metal, I don't know, bowls. And then the, the sun would evaporate the water and they'd have salt. 
But this was against the law, right? Because the British weren't, it wouldn't be able to make money off of them. So he had this demonstration at the salt mines because they wanted to close them down. And um, the way the demonstration was organized was that there was kind of a, a ditch and then you walk up and here's the, the salt mine but it has a big fence. It's just that nonviolent resistance means you symbolically climb the fence and you get arrested. But if enough people get arrested, you can't fill up the jails and prisons, you know, all of a sudden it's a, it's a mess, right? You're, you're messing with the system and you're trying to get it to break down without violence, all right? So, um, on May 4th, uh, less than a month after he'd become a salt criminal, he got arrested for this. Uh, he was arrested, okay? Several days before his arrest, he'd informed the viceroy, the viceroy is the top guy in um, India, God willing, he would raid the salt works. Um, but God was not willing. He got arrested. So um, there was another leader in the movement substituted for him. Now, this is the picture I want to get in your mind. And again, if you want to watch the movie, 2,500 volunteers participated. Before proceeding, the leader warned them that they would be beaten. But he said, you must not resist. You must not even raise a hand to ward off a blow, okay? So um, Gandhi's son advanced at the head of the marchers and approached the great salt pans, with, which were surrounded by ditches and barbed wire. And they were guarded by 400 India, native Indian policemen under the command of six officers. This is the way you oppress people, okay? What you do is you hire some of the indigenous people and you give them much better jobs than they would otherwise have. So their standard of living goes way up. But what they have to do is all this dirty work. They have to turn on their own people, okay? Um, okay. I think some of those Russians, I think part of the reason Putin's campaign is not working very well is I have the suspicion that some of those Russian soldiers do not really want to kill the Ukrainians. And that's why the campaign isn't working well. But that's just a suspicion um, because a lot of them are Ukrainians. Uh, so anyway, but this is um, when you can get the police force to not follow the commands, then, you know, the British lose, but not at this point. At this point, they were doing what they were told. In complete silence, the Gandhi men drew up and halted a hundred miles from the stockade, a hundred yards, a picked column. So there are like 20 of them. And the leader, you know, points to them and says, okay, your turn. Um, advanced from the crowd, waded through the ditches and approached the barbed wire stockade. The officers ordered them to retreat, but they continued forward. Suddenly, at a word of command, scores of native policemen rushed upon the advancing marchers and rained blow on their heads with steel shod clubs, okay? They're steel, they're not just wood. Um, not one of the marchers even raised an arm to fend off the blows. They went down like ten pins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening whack of the clubs on unprotected skulls. The waiting crowd of marchers groaned and sucked in their breath in sympathetic pain at every blow. Those struck down fell sprawling, unconscious or writhing with fractured skulls or broken shoulders. The survivors without breaking ranks silently and doggedly marched on until they were struck 
down. When the first column was laid low, another advanced. I cry every time I read this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Although everyone knew that within a few minutes he would be beaten down, perhaps killed, I could detect no sign of wavering or fear. They marched steadily with their heads up without the encouragement of music or cheering or any possibility that they might escape injury or death. The police rushed out methodically and mechanically beat down the second column. There was no fight, no struggle. The marchers simply walked forward until they were struck down. Another group of 25 advanced and sat down. The police commenced savagely kicking the seated men in the abdomen and testicles. Another column presented itself. Enraged, the police dragged them by their arms and feet and threw them into the ditches. One was dragged to a ditch where I stood. The splash of his body doused me with muddy water. Another policeman dragged a Gandhi man to the ditch, threw him in, and belabored him over the head with his club. Here, hour after hour, hour after hour, stretcher, bear stretcher bearers carried back a stream of inert, bleeding men. A British officer, okay, the, okay, you got it pictured, hour after hour. Then the raids and beatings continued for several days. All right, do you understand the impact of this? When the British found out, when, you know, there started to be cameras, pictures were taken, this became public, international news. It didn't spread like it does now, but okay. Then he says, India was now free, legal... <laughs> Legally, technically, nothing had changed. India was still a British colony, but there was a difference. And Tagore explained it. He told the Manchester Guardian on, in 1930, Europe has completely lost her formal moral prestige in Asia. She's no longer regarded as the champion throughout the world of fair dealing and the exponent of high principle but as the upholder of Western race supremacy and the exploiter of those outside her own borders. For Europe, this is an actual fact, a great moral defeat that has happened. Even though Asia is physically weak and unable to protect herself from aggression where her vital interests are menaced, nonetheless, she can now afford to look down on Europe where before she looked up. Tagore attributed the achievement in India to Gandhi. The salt march and its aftermath did two things. It gave the Indians the conviction they could lift the foreign yoke from their shoulders, and it made the British aware that they were subjugating India. It was inevitable after 1930 that India would someday refuse to be ruled and more importantly, that England would someday refuse to rule. When the Indians allowed themselves to be beaten with batons and rifle butts and did not cringe, they showed that England was powerless and India was invincible. The rest was merely a matter of time. Okay, I do have time, <laughs> I have seven more minutes. But does everybody understand that that's why I think human history is spiritual in the sense that people are acting for the sake of something, right? It could be greed, it could be power, but whatever it is, it's spiritual. It's not physical. It's not just based on observations and hypotheses and evidence or anything. It's an idea of the good that drives people and it can drive people into these very amazing things. No animal would do anything like that, right? It's not 
completely goes against our animal instincts, but for the sake of a better future, human beings will do a lot if they envision a better future, especially for their children, right? They will do amazing things. Um, and they have a sense of their common humanity. Like the best way to oppress people is convince them that they really are by nature inferior. Or Gandhi was, he, the, he was convinced that his culture was, by, was inferior. He knew he could go through law school, so he wasn't intellectually inferior, but he was convinced he was culturally inferior until he realized that was a lie. And then everybody in the world realized it was a lie after, after a while. So colonialism was not only did we exploit these people's res natural resources and we exploited their people we exploited that we colonized their minds, right? We convinced them that what we were doing was good or acceptable. And that was it, 1930 in India, no way. Like we have a common humanity and nobody gets to treat other people this way and nobody should ever allow themselves to be treated this way. And so, you know, it was a big shift. So, Right now, I don't really know what's going to happen, but this war in Ukraine is having this effect. There's a big shift going on. And, you know, I'm not quite sure everything that's going to shift, but 9-11 was a big shift. And um, I remember teaching this class um, my, the fall version of it came a week after 9-11 or a couple weeks. And we did talk about, right, what is this doing for karma? And it turned out that the U.S. didn't handle it at all well, just made it into a lot more bad karma. I could tell that story, but this is a different event. But it's, is it going to awaken people? in the West to the value of the West, because Putin really is an authoritarian guy and we really don't want authoritarianism or are people just gonna, I, I don't know. I mean, not so long ago, Mr. Trump liked Putin. Mr. Bush liked Putin. They were on board. And Trump liked authoritarian, he liked the head of Saudi Arabia and Poland and Hungary. Every single leader that he said he liked was authoritarian. And he did not get along with the head of Germany and England. He, that, that's just a fact. So what is going to happen with this Putin thing, right? Are we going to go, wait a sec, wait a sec. I don't think authoritarianism is really all that good or what I don't know but I know it's this kind of a shift okay that's going on um it's happened before in history it will happen again um let's see I have I have a little section here on do you guys have four more minutes? Or should I just wait till next time? Uh, I have I have four minutes. It's up to Jeff. Sure. Okay, this one is about Churchill. Okay, and you get Churchill, oh, he was so great. He led the British again, blah, blah, blah. Okay. This is about Churchill's attitude toward Gandhi, okay? <laughs> prime Minister, um, the Prime Minister was embarrassed to be the jailer of Gandhi. From all over the world and his own country came a deluge of telegrams asking for Gandhi's release. There was a round table conference, right? They're gonna have a conference now, right? We gotta, we gotta figure out what to do in this situation because it was a crisis. Uh, a round table conference attended by Indians who were the viceroy's appointees. Remember the viceroy is the head 
the British head in India. They met in London, all right? So the Viceroy appointed native Indian people to go to the conference. This is a breakthrough, right? Nobody ever asked them their opinion before. Um, but it came to nothing because the only popular organization in India, nobody from there was invited, right? So the Viceroy invited these people, but they were just suck ups to the West. They weren't people that anybody in India identified with. So the thing broke down. Then they realized they've they got to get serious about this. It was more than dramatic. It was historic. Winston Churchill saw this better than anyone. He was revolted, he declared, by, quote, the nauseating and humiliating spectacle of this one-time inner temple lawyer, now a seditious uh, religious leader, striding half naked up the steps of the viceroy's palace, there to negotiate on equal terms with the representative of the king emperor, right? He, Churchill is livid. Like, oh my God, the viceroy has to meet with Gandhi. Oh my God, this is awful. Churchill's anger and contempt undisguised and ferocious, did not blur his vision. He grasped the basic fact, which was not the state of Gandhi's undress or his previous profession, but the equality he had acquired and was asserting with the Viceroy. Gandhi had not come to petition for favors. He came as the leader of a nation to negotiate on equal terms with the representative of another nation. Um, but the British government had no intention of giving India freedom, independence, dominion status, or even lesser rights. Winston Churchill was prime minister. He was always guided by his famous dictum, quote, I have not become the king's first minister in order to preside at the liquidation of the British empire. He detested probably feared Gandhi. Um, Gandhiism and all it stands for must ultimately be grappled with and finally crushed, he said in 1935. Now he was in office, supreme office. He intended to crush Gandhi in order to save England. Churchill fought the Second war, World War to preserve the heritage of Britain. Would he permit this half naked uh, religious freak to rob her of that heritage? We mean to hold our own, he said. India was England's property. He refused to relinquish it. Um, from the time he became minister in 1940 to 1945, when he was ousted from office, he waged war with Gandhi. Um, and then I go back to page eight, and then I'm just about done. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know. I guess. Oh. Um, I guess that's it. I mean, eventually he had to give up, and he... But it was after Churchill stepped down before they got their independence. I can't find page 108. I'm sorry. Oh, here it is. Sorry. Um, OK, so the next section, though, is about Gandhi's view of God. And so my main point is that Churchill never did you know, anything but contempt for Gandhi, which I think is horrible. <laughs> what do you think, you guys? Just for a minute. Does this surprise you, Melanie? Um, yeah, it surprises me, especially like um, the first article, or not article, but the first story you read that, yeah, that was crazy to me. 
the salt works yes well you know that that happened during the civil rights movement too people let themselves get beaten and people started to change their minds um with the black lives matter it just seems like there's been a backlash pretty quick but we'll see and time will tell on that one too um what about you jack yeah, I, I don't know if it surprises me that he doesn't like Gandhi. Um, Churchill is kind of a... He was well, racist. I yeah. mean, but but the publicly that he would speak with such contempt in public, right, to get quoted, mm. that's what shocked me, right? Yeah. Um, all right, so I just to make analogies... <laughs> Recently, the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, there's all these analysts. Oh, things have changed. I mean, like with Obama, we're in a post-racial society. That's just BS. Um, but the question is, what did happen with Black Lives Matter? And the coming election is going to use racism to get votes. It's in the name of, I don't want my kids to have to learn stuff that's anti-white or something like that. So they're really using racism, latent racism, but it's always covered up, you know, to win elections. And we'll just see where that goes, right? But it's just this consciousness raising the Black Lives Matter and now the war, the Ukraine with Ukraine. That's another thing where there's raised consciousness about glorifying authoritarianism what is it really <laughs> and there has been a rise in authoritarianism over the last 10 years how is this going to affect that i'm i'm just curious um do both of you understand that these are spiritual things going on in the culture right now yes yes ma'am okay the song is so dr beck thinks Human history is spiritual, and she's weird, and that's it. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Dr. Beck. Bye, Dr. Beck.